Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report for the week ending April 1st. Yeah, I know April Fool's Day, but uh, we'll let the people on Facebook handle that. We're going to do we're going to do some real science this week. No April Fools. First up, this was sent by my friend Bonnie from Missouri. This is from NationalGeographic.com, and as usual, all the links to all the articles will be down in the description. Spinach leaf transformed into beating human heart tissue using the plant-like scaffolding. Scientists have built a mini version of a working heart, which may one day aid in tissue regeneration. The problem with uh, making small blood vessels and veins and stuff like that is it's just so difficult to do using even printing processes and as a matter of fact uh, my former dentist she uh, left to have a baby her husband actually works in that business where they're working on developing uh, the larger style blood vessels and veins and stuff like that to be able to print them on an actual um, similar I guess to a computer printer actually print out blood vessels and stuff but these are really really these are when you really need tiny ones to uh, produce uh, vessels that can uh, run a heart or something like that so I'll just read a little bit of the article here. Scientists have found a way to use spinach to build working human heart muscle potentially solving a long-standing problem in efforts to repair damaging, damaged organs. Their study published this month by the journal Biomaterials offers a new way to grow a vascular system which has been a roadblock for tissue engineering. Scientists already created large-scale human tissue in lab using methods like 3D printing. That's what I was talking to you about that um, my dentist's husband uh, is working in. But it's been much harder to grow the small, delicate blood vessels that are vital to tissue health. The main limiting factor for tissue engineering is the lack of a vascular network, says study co-author Joshua Gerschlack, a graduate student at War Worcester Polytechnic Institute in Massachusetts. And it's probably Worcester, but, you know, I mispronounced it anyway. Hey, I'm not from Massachusetts. Uh, in a video describing the study, and you can scroll down, and there's actually one of the people that um, do one of the um, study participants uh, or whatever... Uh, has a video, a YouTube video, kind of telling some details about it. But the article still basically explains that the eventual goal is to be able to replace damaged tissue in patients who have heart, heart attacks or have suffered other cardiac issues that prevent their hearts from contracting. Like blood vessels, the veins, and the modified leaves would deliver oxygen to the entire swath of replacement tissue, which is crucial in re regenerating new heart matter. So not only will they maybe eventually be able to regrow a new heart, they can probably sooner than that replace it, replace parts of your heart that's damaged and get it full uh, with full blood flow. That's the main thing too. Using something for a pattern or a scaffolding when you're talking about really, really tiny, delicate things like very, very tiny veins and capillaries and stuff like that. So good about that. And let's see. This next one is from my friend Michael Jones, the teacher. He's actually been on the TDD report before when we were talking about, uh, I think he helped me out when I was talking about uh, possibly cursive writing coming to an end. But anyway, this article is about why American farmers are hacking their tractors with Ukrainian firmware. A dive into the thriving black market of John Deere tractor hacking. To avoid the draconian locks that John Deere puts on tractors, they buy farmers throughout America's heartlands and started hacking their equipment with firmware that's cracked in Eastern Europe and traded in invite-only paid online forums. I guess you have to pay to get into these forums, but all the farmers are aware of it, and you can get some hacked far, uh, firmware to, to download into your tractor and then be able to do some of the repairs yourself. This harkens back to, uh, oh, I think it was more than five years ago where the uh, independent mechanics were complaining that the uh, firmware in cars was locked down so much that they could not do diagnosis or repair on a lot of vehicles for customers. The customers would just have to take them to a regular dealership that had the proprietary software that could even maybe diagnose the problem and then find a way to, uh, you know, deal with the problem. So what happened is uh, eventually Massachusetts passed a law that they had to let uh, independent shops have access to the same software that the dealers did. And then rather than fight lawsuits all the way across the country, the automakers actually voluntarily agreed to just say, okay, we'll abide by the Massachusetts rule for all 50 states. So now independent shops can have access to the software that runs your vehicle. So to me, this should be just a cookie cutter thing. And I think for uh, they should just pass legislation for uh, all types of farm equipment or any new technology to come on board that uh, you have to be able to let independent shops or independent people have access to work on this, especially if they bought it themselves. This is not like people are, you know, um, doing this to try to, to try to steal software or anything or try to crack software to be some kind of sophisticated hacker. The farmers just basically want to be able to fix their own equipment, which I think they should be entitled to do if they paid for it. I mean, I can see not um, rewriting the code and then selling the code to other people as far as, you know, um, 
new upgrades and stuff like that. Although I don't know, maybe maybe even for that might be a consideration. But uh, I'm just basically saying for personal use, you should be able to actually have access to enough firmware to be able to do ordinary repairs on your own vehicle, be it a car, a motorcycle, a tractor, or any kind of vehicle. I mean, it might be eventually uh, refrigerators get so sophisticated that they try to lock down the software where you can't um, do your own diagnosis and change out a compressor on your own refrigerator without going to the manufacturer, and that's rather ridiculous. So I think they should just make a blanket law to cover um, any new mechanical type of machines in the future, uh, you know, not just uh, tractors, cars and motorcycles, but pretty much anything in the future that uses proprietary software um, if it's needed to be repaired by independent people or the owner should be able to have accessible software. So this next one is from Navy Thomas 8, Fox News Tech. This Valkyrie R5 humanoid robot is put to the test with Mars colonization on the horizon. NASA Space Robotics Challenge awarded Northeastern University with a $2 million Valkyrie Robonaut 5 robot, which is now undergoing tests in a Massachusetts warehouse to prepare for the finalist round this June in a virtual simulation of a red planet landing. Yeah, that would be kind of, I mean, and then the rest of it just gets on to detail about it. I think that would be a good way to prepare for Mars, too, besides just bringing the equipment to Mars and the um, supplies and stuff like that ahead of time, and then maybe your return craft, which you should definitely do. Uh, you should probably set some kind of robots uh, there that can do some kind of simple labor and, and do more setting up the equipment for the human beings that are going to arrive. So uh, it says NASA reportedly produced three other R5 models, one which was held in-house, and NASA awarded two as research loans to Northeastern University and nearby MIT, while the fourth was acquired by Scotland's University of Edinburgh. So have a lot of independent people working on the same idea, too. And while we're at it, I want to get to this... Uh, this is just going to be a link. I won't really talk about it a heck of a lot, but it goes, uh, the Congress Bill, uh, number, uh, the 115th Congress Bill 442, which the President signed uh, as far as NASA's budgets and projects, is way heavier now in demand exploration of space, but it's also losing some of the programs, and one in particular that I'm kind of sad about is the uh, Asteroid Diversion Program. It's cutting that back, I think, to pretty much zero. So um, I think that was an important program, really, the Asteroid Diversion Program. But on the other hand, there's a lot of things, if you're into NASA, to be thankful for. And uh, we're getting way, way more back into manned exploration, which absolutely means that other projects, robotic projects and certain probes and certain launches for other things that were uh, not related to manned exploration of space will probably be put on hold or canceled. So nobody gets all of what they want, but everybody gets a little bit of something. And I'm Overall, I guess I'm pretty happy about it that we're getting back into manned space exploration because I think if we screw off for another five or six years, I think China and Russia are going to be way ahead of us, and maybe even India by that time. So we need to get back to being able to put our own astronauts in outer space with our own equipment, um, even if it's not NASA, even if it's maybe subcontractor or, or private American corporations' equipment. We need to get back into uh, manned exploration of not just uh, low orbit space, but onto the moon again if it's for practice to going on to Mars. I would not like to have the, the moon be an end-all be-all again, but um, anything that will eventually get us to Mars, that's what, it, that's what I think it's all about. So anyway, that's about it for this week. Take care, everybody. I will catch you next week.